The Economist. Hello and welcome to The Intelligence from The Economist. I'm Jason Palmer. And I'm Rosie Bloor. Every weekday, we provide a fresh perspective on the events shaping your world. Artificial intelligence is supposed to make us all more productive. So why do women use it less often than men? Our correspondent looks into the gender gap and explains how it could hurt women's careers. And we recently heard about a preponderance of water on Mars, but that probably won't help much with making the planet habitable. Some other new research, though, absolutely would. We ask first how to warm the place up a bit. But first... In a defiant press conference last night, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu defended his country's war in Gaza. Over the weekend, the bodies of six Israeli hostages were recovered. They had been kidnapped almost a year ago on October the 7th, though Netanyahu asked the families of the hostages for their forgiveness. He also said that he would not surrender to domestic pressure. <laughs> News of the hostages' deaths has prompted huge demonstrations across Israel. More than 100,000 protesters came out onto the streets demanding that the government agree to a ceasefire. A general strike shut shopping malls, universities and government ministries. International pressure has increased too. President Joe Biden was asked yesterday if Netanyahu was doing enough to secure a hostage deal. He replied with a simple no. Britain has said it will suspend some of its arms sales. But as the war drags on and thousands die, the question remains, will anything move Israel's prime minister? The protests over the last two or three days have been the largest since the war began 11 months ago. Anshul Pfeffer is our Israel correspondent. There is a real feeling of anger, a feeling almost of desperation. The fact that these six hostages were, according to forensic evidence, alive shortly before they were found, and the fact that there are still live hostages, but they're in huge jeopardy right now, that's really fueled the protests. Anshul, you've been onto the streets. Why has the recovery of these bodies generated so much anger when apparently the continued waging of the war, the death toll of the Palestinians and of Israeli soldiers has not? Well, the death toll on both sides has been horrific. There's so many reasons for Israelis to be angry and desperate. But I think from the start of this war, Israelis have been so emotionally invested in the release of the hostages. Their names, their faces have been out on the streets on every screen, on every street in Israel. And just the fact that some of these hostages were to be released in the first stage of a deal made it feel so close yet so so lost for so many Israelis. There was a real feeling that at least some of these hostages could have been saved. And instead, there were six funerals this week. And sure, there are so many things that they should be protesting about. But I think there is also a limited emotional bandwidth here, which Israelis can direct at any type of victim. And the hostages are the most immediate, most relatable figures, I think, for Israelis. We've heard particularly about one hostage, Hirsch Goldberg, in the international press. Can you just tell me a bit about him and why the death of Hirsch Goldberg is seen as so significant? So uh, Hersh Goldberg Polin, uh, to give his full name, has uh, become one of the most recognized faces of those 250 hostages, partly because he's just, well, he was now really a fun-loving, very relatable 23-year-old, a young man who was very much involved in social activism. He was working in an organization to bring Jewish and Arab kids together through football. And more than anything else, because of his parents, Rachel and John, who flew across the world wherever they could to raise awareness to his plight and that of the other hostages. At this moment, 109 treasured human beings 
are being held hostage by Hamas in Gaza. They are Christians. They spoke uh, at the United Nations, at the Democratic Party Convention, they were at the Vatican, really anywhere they could go on any media with any type of opinion makers or decision makers around the world. They were there and as a result, Hirsch's funeral was attended by thousands. I felt when I was there, there were tens of thousands of people there and also the president, Isaac Herzog, was there though the family asked for other politicians to stay away. As a human being, as a father, and as the president of the state of Israel, I want to say how sorry I am. How sorry I am that we didn't protect Hirsch on that dark day. How sorry I am that we failed to bring him home in his life. Both his name and his face were recognized by anyone in Israel and by many people around the world. I can tell you from where I live in Jerusalem, which is the same neighborhood where Hirsch lived, there isn't a wall without either a poster with his face or graffiti saying Hirsch is still alive. He was very much the face of the campaign to release the hostages. And is there any prospect that Netanyahu will change his policy over a possible deal that could secure hostage releases? It doesn't look like it right now. Just a few hours after Hirsch's funeral, he held a rare press conference in Jerusalem where he was very adamant that Israel is going to stay in the Philadelphia Corridor. Now, the Philadelphia Corridor is Gaza's border with Egypt, which Israel captured about three months ago. And in the last few weeks, Netanyahu has made that into a cardinal issue. He calls it an existential issue. And holding on to the, the Philadelphia Corridor, he says, is what will prevent Hamas from smuggling arms to carry out another October 7. So this has now become something which is not just the main sticking point in the negotiations between Israel and Hamas over a possible deal. It also becomes something that Netanyahu has made into the be-all and end-all of his government's policy in Gaza. And so far, he doesn't seem to be willing to budge on that. And if domestic pressure isn't going to force Netanyahu to budge, is there any prospect that international pressure could? So we've been hearing for months now that the Americans are going to put out yet another proposal for a ceasefire and for hostage release in Gaza. Now the administration is talking about their final proposal that will come out in a few days. But despite all the phone calls from Joe Biden to Netanyahu, despite by now I think 11 visits by Secretary of State Antony Blinken to urge the Israeli government to make some kind of uh, movement towards this agreement, we're not seeing it happen. We also have to obviously mention that Hamas is a side to this as well. They also have their demands. They haven't agreed to the deal as it's been proposed by the Americans either. So right now, it doesn't look like we're going to get anywhere. Who knows, maybe in a few days, there will be some kind of breakthrough, but we've been waiting for a real breakthrough for months and it hasn't happened yet. And yesterday, Britain's foreign minister said that Britain would suspend some arms sales to Israel, which was a first for Britain and a first, I think, internationally from the big Western allies. Is that kind of move going to change anything? Israeli officials have said to me that as it is, Israel bought only a very tiny amount of security-related material from the UK. So for at least from a military point of view, this won't have any real effect on Israel. But it is part of a growing feeling of pressure, international pressure on Israel. Britain is still seen as a major ally, probably much more important than any arms sales. It's the intelligence sharing that Israel and the UK have. It's military coordination. The UK was part of the operation back in April to help shield Israel from the salvo of over 300 Iranian rockets and drones. So it's a partnership that Israel values. But at the same time, this doesn't seem to be a real sanction against Israel. It seems to be much more of a symbolic gesture, probably for internal British politic purposes. But it may be the start of something bigger. And that's what Israeli officials are worried about. And so what happens next? That's a question that we've been asking here on the podcast so many times over the last 11 months. And it really doesn't look like we have a way out right now from the impasse. The Israeli operations in Gaza are at a relatively low level to what we've seen in the last few months. But at the same time, it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. We've still got the situation in Israel's northern border where Hezbollah is still shelling Israel and Israel's firing back. 
They're still waiting for some kind of Iranian retaliation to the assassination in Tehran five weeks ago. It's a situation where everyone seems to be waiting for something to happen to change matters, but nobody seems to have a clear idea what that could be. And Joel, thank you so much. I fear I may ask you that question again very soon. Thank you for having me, Rosie. So when you go online and you type in ChatGPT, one of the first things it says is, be more productive. Emily Steinmark is a science correspondent at The Economist. That's how it sells itself to workers, to people that are interested in using it as a productivity tool. But despite hopes in industry that this technology, generative AI, will work as a productivity boost for many workers, not everyone is on board. Two recent studies have looked at exactly who is and isn't using ChatGPT. So I have a tab open in my browser with ChatGPT. It's the new one, 4.0. I have just uploaded one of the studies by Humlum and Vestigal, and I'm going to ask it to give me a quick summary of this paper, highlighting the main findings in less than 100 words. Okay, and it's just typing some stuff out, and we're going to ask it to read it aloud. The paper by Humlum and Vestergaard, 2024, examines the adoption of ChatGPT among workers in Denmark. It finds that ChatGPT is widely used, with 50% of workers in exposed occupations having adopted it, but significant disparities exist. Women are 20% less likely to use ChatGPT than men. So, Emily, in your own non-AI-generated words, uh, is that what the study said? And what did you get out of it? I think it's pretty good, yes. If it were me who was summarising this, I would probably flag the main strength of the paper, which I really think is the fact that they look at just how persistent this gender gap is, this difference in use. Because you might think, well, there are perhaps more men employed in more techie roles and more women employed in in less techie roles, and that would just naturally give a gender gap. From the summary, you wouldn't get that actually this persists in all the different professions that they looked at within the profession, within the same workplace, doing the same tasks. So these are basically the same people with the same jobs using ChatGPT differently. And for me, that's where this paper really stands out. Um, As we say in journalism, they slightly buried the lead. That's exactly what they did, yeah. (laughs) So what on earth is going on? And I feel like I should fess up here that I don't use AI very much at all. I mean, perhaps not generative AI. You might use transcription tools and those sorts of things. So that's the thing, right? We should all remember that we're all kind of already using AI to make loads of jobs at work easier. But I take your point. I think the thing that is happening is a little bit difficult to explain. And we can't use this Danish study alone. But a study in Norway, which looked at undergraduate students at the Norway School of Economics, where they only have one undergraduate program, so everyone is basically studying the same thing, dug in a little bit more to try and find out what could be the reason for this difference. And what they found was that some women do seem to be less confident in their prompting abilities when they use ChatGPT. But actually, it's probably to do with something else entirely, which is women's perception of ChatGPT and whether or not it makes them better at their work. So they have this gender cap. But interestingly, what they find is when they break that down, they see that lower performing women or the women with lower entry level grades use ChatGPT about as much as men who use it the same regardless of grades. But middle, better and high performing women use it much less. So really the gender gap in ChatGPT use, certainly amongst university students, is a gap for the higher achieving women. So why are high achieving women not using ChatGPT? I still don't quite understand. No, it's a curious one. But the researchers did a very clever thing, which was that they asked them to imagine two scenarios. One in which their professor explicitly forbade them using ChatGPT and one in which the professor explicitly gave them permission to use it. 
And what they saw was that in the forbidden situation, there was no change in distribution. The higher achieving women would not use it. The lower achieving women would use it as much as men. If there was a policy that encouraged or explicitly allowed it, everyone, regardless of grades, would use it to an equal extent. And what that seems to suggest is that higher performing women impose a ban on themselves. They act as though there is a ban, even though at the time the university had no policy on ChatGPT. So it's to do with a sort of perception that it's cheating. When I asked the researchers about this, they called this a good girl phenomenon, right? This is meant to be difficult. Pain is part of the journey, right? If you're working hard, it's meant to be hard. If you take shortcuts and use ChatGPT, you're cheating basically, regardless of what anyone tells you. And that seems to really affect the women at the higher end of the performance distribution. It's fascinating that there's that very famous book, The Curse of the Good Girl. What impact might this have then on the careers of these high achieving women? Well, I mean, these researchers thought of everything because then a few weeks ago, they added a second survey to their study, which is equally interesting. They went and asked over a thousand hiring managers in firms that have a history of hiring graduates from this particular university and undergraduate program. And they asked them how likely they were to hire somebody with AI expertise. And what they found was that the hiring managers valued the higher performing women with AI experience 8% higher than higher performing women, everything else the same, apart from the fact that they had no AI experience. That AI expertise premium does not exist for men. So how concerned should we be about these high achieving women missing out? Well, it depends on who you ask, right? Some of the people I spoke to said that there's a risk that if women are not part of this first generation of users, then future generative AI tools that more embedded into the workplace could be designed specifically for men. But other people were less worried. One person I spoke to, Daniel Lee at at MIT, said there is no evidence at the moment that these people that were surveyed actually were more productive or managed to do better work with ChatGPT. And so it could be that right now, It's just basically a toy on the internet. And the women that are choosing not to use it could be making a sensible calculation about how best to spend their time. And right now, that might be not being distracted by ChatGPT whilst at work. Emily, thank you so much. I'm off to go and learn how to use AI just in case. (laughs) Thanks for having me. And I should remind listeners that we've been answering your questions about artificial intelligence on the show. So if there's anything you want to know about AI, please do write in to podcast.economist.com and someone better qualified than I am will try to answer your question. And later this week, Babbage, our science podcast, asks a really big question. What is artificial general intelligence? You'll need to be a subscriber to listen to that. Search Economist Podcast Plus if you aren't one yet. The ancients knew about Mars. Sumerians, Egyptians, Babylonians, the Greeks called the nearer planets wanderers. But it took until the age of the telescope to identify Mars as a planet. Thanks, Galileo. Since then, plenty have dared dream about what it would be like to live there, not least science fiction authors and filmmakers. Okay, we're ready to light this candle. Let's go to Mars. Films from Mission to Mars to John Carter to The Martian. I am the greatest botanist on this planet. To a personal favorite, Total Recall. You were interested in a memory of uh, Mars. All planted the idea in the heads of would-be Earth escapees, like Elon Musk. Where we need to go from these early exploration missions to actually building a city. Thing is, making it livable is going to take some doing. Mars, if you could land there, is not exactly the friendliest place in the solar system to be. The average temperature is about minus 65 degrees Celsius. You can't breathe there because the atmosphere is too thin. And even if you could, there isn't any oxygen in it anyway. You'd be baked and fried by UV radiation from the sun because the thin atmosphere doesn't really block any of it out. And the ground beneath your feet is soaked in poisonous chlorine compounds. Tim Cross is a senior science writer at The Economist. 
We know it hasn't always been quite that bad, though. There's a lot of evidence, if you look at the geology, where you can see things like dried up river basins and so on, that at some point Mars had liquid water on its surface, which meant it must have been warmer and there must have been more of an atmosphere. So it's a real fixer-upper of a planet, in other words. And if you did want to try and renovate it and make it hospitable to earthly life, the first step, I think, would be to heat it up. Okay, so how to do that first step then? Well, one idea is described in a paper that's just been published in Science Advances by uh, Samana Ansari, who's at Northwestern University. And the idea is you would essentially cause deliberate climate change on Mars. You'd flood the atmosphere with this artificial dust that's made up of tiny little metal particles that are sort of nine millionths of a metre long each. And they would do what greenhouse gases do on Earth, only much, much more efficiently. So the idea is they would reflect heat coming from the surface that would otherwise be lost to space, which would warm the planet up. And in fact, it would warm it up, or the calculations suggest it could warm it up enough so that the ice, the water ice, which we know is frozen under the regolith, which is the sort of fancy sciencey term for what Mars has in, instead of soil, that would start to melt, especially in Mars's summer, and you would get liquid water on the surface once again. Okay, so the principle seems clear, but like, how is that actually done in practice? Well, so funnily enough, that kind of left in the paper is a bit of an exercise for the reader. The idea is you would either have to manufacture this dust like in situ on Mars, or you'd have to ship a load of it in from Earth. But if you sort of run that idea through a Martian climate model, and they do have such things, the numbers come back and say you'd need to pump about 30 litres of this dust per second into the atmosphere to see a boost in the average temperature of about 30 degrees Celsius or more within a few decades. 30 litres a second doesn't sound like too much in the short run. But of course, if you're doing that continuously over 10 or 20 or 30 years, it adds up to an awful lot of stuff. But what's interesting about the paper, I guess, is that it's a big improvement on what was the state of the art, if you can call a sort of almost entirely theoretical idea, the state of the art. Um, There was another paper published about two decades ago that tried to do the same thing with chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs, which older listeners might remember used to be in things like fridges and are extremely potent greenhouse gases, much more potent than carbon dioxide. And the sort of headline number is that this new method of using artificial dust is around 5,000 times more efficient in mass terms than using CFCs would be. And it also has the advantage that there isn't much fluorine, which is one of the components of CFCs on Mars, But this dust can be made of iron or aluminium or something like that, which is kind of plentiful. Okay, but as you say, that is kind of just step one. We we get the temperature up, we get liquid water, but it's still a pretty crappy place to live, right? Yeah, so you've still got the UV, you've still got the problems in the soil. Although one interesting side effect is that if you could raise the temperature of Mars significantly, a bit like on Earth, where you get sort of secondary effects, you might see some of the carbon dioxide ice that you get at the poles start to sublimate. So the pressure of the Martian atmosphere would go up. And people have been looking at at ways to fix some of the other problems. So we know these poisonous compounds in the regolith, uh, perchlorates, there are bacteria on Earth that can actually break them down into chloride and oxygen. So if you could take the genes from those bacteria that's responsible for doing that, and stick them in other kinds of bacteria that we know can live in very arid, very dry, very UV-soaked environments, and we do have them as well, you could perhaps then seed those bacteria onto Mars, and over time they turn the perchlorates into useful things. They turn them into chlorides and oxygen, in fact, so you would start to get a bit of oxygen in the air as well. So, you know, if you're painting in very broad brushes and assuming you've got cheap space flight and a few thousand years to do this or a few hundred years, then you're starting to see the outlines of a way in which you might be able to do something quite spectacular. There was a couple of big ifs along there. Am I too cynical to think that this is all still too many steps of too much fanciful? Yeah, I mean, this is far future stuff. So it's common in science fiction. You could sort of argue that we've done something similar to the Earth by mistake because we've warmed the Earth's climate by about 1.5 Celsius, which I guess is kind of a proof of principle that this sort of thing is possible. But yeah, if you wanted to do this on Mars, you would need a way either to sort of set up a factory on the surface or to ship an awful lot of stuff there. We do have these big, lavishly funded rocketry companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin, and their founders are both very keen to get humans off the Earth and elsewhere in the solar system and so on. But I think this is one that maybe our distant descendants might be looking back on in 300 years and thinking it all started here. Thanks for all that, Tim. And if I happen to live that long, I'll see you on Mars. Thanks, Jason.
That's all for this episode of The Intelligence. And don't forget, if you're a subscriber, you can listen to all our podcasts ad-free on The Economist app. If you have any thoughts on the show, please let us know. You can get in touch at podcasts at economist.com. And from today, students aged 16 and over around the world have free access to our daily news app, Espresso. Find out more on economist.com. We'll see you back here tomorrow.